Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizational team, Elena Hilp, and then obviously Jairo and all the scientific committee, scientific organization committee to put, for putting together this beautiful workshop in a beautiful place with beautiful wine. Really enjoy, so Jairo, thanks very much. I'll talk about not strain, but transport in, amongst others, Alta Magnets. Mm. And I'd like to start off by saying that this is not at all my own particular result, uh, but this is an endeavor from a large group of people, uh, in particular, uh, unofficially, the Prague, Mainz, Alta Magnet Mafia. Um, so Helena Reichlova, Dominik Kriegner, and uh, Tonda Badura have been very beneficial. And then we get beautiful theory support from Tomasz, uh, obviously, and then Libor and Jairo uh, in Mainz. Um, and at least at the, in the last part of the talk, I'll show you samples that were made in Marseille in a joint French-German project. So we have uh, growth uh, and structural characterization of the samples in Marseille. And then we uh, team also with the people at Spintech, uh, Vincent Balz and his team. Um, in terms of transport experiments. Some of the results I'll show still go back to my time at uh, TU Dresden, uh, and Richard Schlitz and now Sebastian Becker, sort of the follow-up uh, PhD, um, really also deserve credit. And then some people in Konstanz were now um, contributed, and we are very grateful for, for support from German Science Foundation. Okay, um, looked at the program. I was a bit shocked because I saw that essentially I had an hour and I don't have results on alter magnets to cover an entire hour. So I will go slow. You all had wine yesterday, I guess. Um, and I'll discuss Hall and Nernst, so transverse transport in ferromagnets to start off with. Um, then I'll move on to antiferromagnets and in the end I'll be covering ultramagnetic samples. Mm -hmm. But first things first, um, transverse transport. If I were to cut the long story short, this is what I would like to convey in the first part of the talk. Uh, there's Hall and Ernst effects in different flavors in ferromagnets, and there's a certain terminology that people use. And I'll try to introduce that step by step. So my cartoon picture here, this gray thing, supposedly depicts a piece of conductor, and if you apply an electric field, you will drive a charge current, this current density J sub C here, um, and this is described in linear response by Ohm's law. Um, I always say this is the theorist version of Ohm's law. Um, it's a very elegant concept. You apply a force, the electric field, um, or a gradient, and you get a res resulting flow. Now, I'm an experimentalist, and unfortunately, this is not the simplest way to measure things. So, for experimentalists, it's much easier to apply a current and measure the ensuing electric fields of voltages. So, that's why experimentalists tend to think in resistivity, which I denote by rho, whereas theorists like conductivity. And it's not so bad. They're both tensorial quantities, and they're inverse one of the other, but this is a non-trivial issue once in a while. And the transverse transport that I'll be focusing on now actually stems or is, is intimately linked to these tensorial properties because in the presence, for instance, of a magnetic field, I'll show that in a second, you can also have electric fields transverse to the current applied, not only along, but also in other orthogonal directions. Um, and that's what I refer to as transverse transport. Uh, and these transverse effects are related to these off-diagonal elements in the tensors. And as I already said, the simplest example uh, is the ordinary Hall effect. So you apply a current in one direction, a magnetic field in the second, and then you get transverse transport in the third, and there's always this cross-product type thing. Um, we joked about this is the, the physicist's greeting, right? So say, say hello. Um, and, and you'll see that all over the place in my presentation. Um, and 
in a simple picture, you can trace the, or understand the ordinary Hall effect to the Lorentz force where you see the cross product. Um, and then you can write down the equations. In fact, there's some subtleties. The Lorentz force will lead to this deviation of the charge carrier motion. And that will take um, some time to build a, a charge accumulation at the edges of the sample under these open transverse boundary conditions. And a, an electric field will build up. That's the field that we, in the end, are measuring. Um, which results in the current flowing straight in steady state again. So there's, it's quite interesting. But um, we measure this electric field, the transverse Hall field, and it's related to this uh, current density by the ordinary Hall coefficient, which I call uh, R0, or RO here. Um, and this, in a simple picture, sim uh, parabolic band, one type of charge carrier only, so free electron gas, then... Um, depends on the charge carrier density. So it's very useful in semiconductor physics. Um, and people widely use it to measure carrier densities, whatever that means in more complex band structures as well. Um, this is data from the original paper by, by Hall. Um, he published a table back 150 years with five data points. And I took the liberty to, to plot them and actually use the symmetry of the Hall effect to also mirror them to negative magnetic fields. And you see that it's, it's nice, it's linear, it goes through the origin, so linear and field as expected. Now, if you have more interesting samples, meaning magnetic samples, you have a finite magnetization. I tried to depict that by these little arrows here, which give rise to this net magnetization, magnetization hysteresis, and so forth. And there is a, another type of Hall effect that then comes into play. Uh, for more information, there's a review by Nagaosa et al. Uh, quoted down here. And interestingly enough, phenomenologically, you can write down very similar expressions for this anomalous Hall effect. It sometimes it's called extraordinary, um, meaning just referring to the Hall effect connected to the magnetization. So you have this anomalous Hall coefficient times the magnetization that now comes into play. Um, I'd like to, to make two comments. One is I repeatedly run into people saying, well, this anomalous Hall and the ordinary Hall are just the same because in a magnet you have flux density, which is H plus M. So it's no surprise that there is also something connected to magnetization. Um, that's correct, but this anomalous Hall coefficient I'm referring to here is not simply an extension of the ordinary Hall to a more complex um, flux densities B, but it really is independent. So this, this R sub A can have different sign, different magnitude, completely different effect. Um, and the second point I'd like to make is that this is really simple. If you look in more detail, for instance, here in this Onoda et al., uh, you'll see that the anomalous Hall coefficient can scale with the longitudinal resistivity or conductivity with some power alpha. Um, and uh, this is, so there's a lot of literature that I'm just brushing over. Could you ask a question? Sure, please. If you go back, it's also surely not the case that a single coefficient will relate the anomalous term to magnetization, right? There's many cases where you have a different width of hysteresis loop in the anomalous yes. case. Yes. And really what the magnetization is doing is breaking time with us and allowing an anomalous Hall term. Yes, yes. I'm, I'll, I'll come to that point. Thanks very much. That's, that's, that's uh, fully correct. Um, this really is phenomenological. Um, and people tend to think that this is sort of established truth, that you get the same magnetization that you measure in the magnetometer also reflected directly in the Hall. And this is not the case. And I think we'll, we'll see some more example at the end of my talk in the ultramagnets. It's very obvious that this connection does not exist. Um, but, but this connection is only claimed for a moves domain sample, so we have domain dynamics. It was never seriously meant to describe anything to yes. domain. Yes, but, but people but looking at... They meant what they took to and yes. Two, yes. It's very yes. different. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I meant, but uh, <laughs> never mind. Fair point. Yeah. <laughs> and just... Just to illustrate that point, um, this is data that we took a while ago on, on this uh, interesting material system, uh, samples by Claudia Felser's group in Dresden. Um, this material system has an, an ordering, a magnetic ordering temperature at around uh, 175 Kelvin, so you can measure above the ordering temperature and you essentially see this straight line, so ordinary hall only. 
And then if you cool down to below the ordering temperature, you see this hysteresis and, and rectangular shape emerging. And now we could argue whether this really is the magnetization or it's just the anomalous Hall effect that, that pops up. Then there is a third variant that people usually invoke uh, in magnets related to these topologically non-trivial spin structures like skirmians. I think the original idea, at least from, if I look it up, goes back to um, Patrick Bruno on a slightly different setting. Uh, and, um, but the, the notion emerged that if you have this finite scalar spin chirality, so again, some weird uh, non-trivial vector thing, um, you can actually rephrase that in terms of a fictitious um, magnetic field. I called it H topo here mm -hmm. in the sample. And then you can write something that people call the topological Hall effect. Um, and you again can give some coefficient times a field um, and then describe these, these additional uh, transport features emerging. One of the early papers is here by Neubauer and, and co. Um, this is manganese silicon, skirmian phase. And so, so this is the Hall trace. And if you look closely, there's these little humps and if you subtract the ordinary hall, then you, you have these, these gray shaded things here, and that's the signature of this skirmian phase in transport and so forth, okay? So to, to sum this up, in the ferromagnets, phenomenologically, you have typically interpret data in terms of these three contributions, ordinary scaling with magnetic field, anomalous scaling with magnetization, and topological scaling with whatever uh, fictitious field. Now you can go from charge-driven, charge-detected transport to thermally-driven, electrically-detected transport. Um, so you replace, depending on how you look at it, either the charge current by a heat current or the electric field driving by a thermal gradient driving. Um, all the rest stays the same. So thermal drive, magnetic field or magnetization in the second direction and then voltage or electric field detected in the third direction. Again, this vectorial thing. Um, and you then need to go back to the Zebeck tensor in principle and the off-diagonal elements of the Zebeck tensor, this S, Y, X here, um, then are called Nernst effect because uh, von Ettingshausen and Nernst were the first to uh, describe this. And long story short, people do exactly the same phenomenology now using the Nernst, the anomalous ordinary anomalous topological Nernst contributions like you do for the Hall. Sebastian, yeah. I would just like to remind uh, that this last plus sign in the alignment is also phenomenology because if this block is actually materially strong, like the heterostructure, yeah. a platinum cobalt, platinum blah, 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 heterostructure, remember. Yes, yes. So, so, so please don't take this as, uh, you know, bulletproof theory. This is just poor experimentalist's approach. You measure, you plug the, and then you just blindly use these equations. Since, and since you're worried about uh, filling up your hour. Uh, <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, uh, when I started looking at this, because I foolishly allowed somebody to measure an anomalous Hall effect from the department a couple of years ago, and I was it's running to think of a huge mistake. Yeah. Um, but even the, the, uh, the decomposition into the sum of resistivity isn't really the right thing to do. You should be doing it as a decomposition of the sum of conductivities, and you get away with this only in very special limits, yeah. right? Yes, yes. Well, you get away often because the conductivity of the diagonal body is also yes. 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 special conditions. Yes. So that's, 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 that's special conditions yeah. apply to all Yes, so, so it's, it's, it's really very phenomenological. Um, I'll, okay, I'll brush over this. There's some more tensor stuff if you want to connect charge and, and, and heat transport. Um, so if you're interested, we might come back to that in the discussion. I'll just quickly flash an example. Also from, from the Dresden time, we, we got these manganese platinum tin thin films, again from Claudia, Claudia Felser's group. And then we patterned them into a, a hall device. So this is our hall bar where we can drive a current in the vertical direction and then measure this uh, transverse voltage with these two leads. And then the red things here are platinum thermometers and heaters. And that means we can apply a thermal gradient up or down, heating either the top or the bottom, and measure the Nernst effect in exactly the same device. So maybe it's easier to, to grasp in these little cartoons down here. So for the Hall effect, again, we drive the current along this thick part of the bar, and we measure transverse voltage. And for the Nernst, we drive thermal and measure transverse voltage. And magnetic field is applied in the third direction.
And this is typical traces that you get. Um, so this now is the whole transverse resistivity versus field. And I'll show you what, what I call PowerPoint karaoke uh, type uh, hall analysis. And, and I'm, I'm not meaning this as an offending thing. This is what we poor experimentalists do. There is no, I, I don't know of much better approach to, to analyze these data. So, so this is what you typically do in the lab. You take these data, then you take the high field slope as the ordinary hall, right? At high magnetic fields, magnetization is saturated, all these topological effects, finite H topo are over. So only the ordinary hall remains. Then you extrapolate that back to zero, and then all the hysteretic step-like features around zero, that must be the anomalous. And then there is these humps left, and boom, that's the topological contribution. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> um, now, what you typically do is you, you don't do this super simple PowerPoint car. Okay, you take magnetometry data. This is this S-shaped curve. So we took a same a piece of the same sample, but obviously larger one because magnetometry and thin films is difficult. We measure the, 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 the hysteresis, the M of H, and then you scale that thing and try to subtract it. And then what is left, so, so this difference then would be topological. And I guess you already, fr from this picture, you can, you can see how uneasy I get, at least, when, I, when we do this type of analysis, because obviously it, it doesn't really, really seem reasonable. But that's, that's what people do, and then you, you get this topological hall, and you can quantify it, and, and people have, have been very excited the last couple of years about these phenomena. Um, now, we did the NERNST in exactly the same sample. And this is what you get if you switch from charge to thermal drive or electric to thermal drive. So you get now the transverse signal. Um, looks pretty similar, but now this, this PowerPoint karaoke really gets, <laughs> gets problematic. So the high field slope is the ordinary, and then whatever is the anomalous here, we don't know. And then the, the, you subtract magnetization off, close your eyes, and then you get the topological one. And okay. Um, might look reasonable or not. And then, then you can look at the amplitudes. I don't want to go into too much detail. We did that for, for many temperatures. Um, and then you can, you can try to compile all your data. And the particular thing about these manganese platinum tin thin films is that they have a higher order phase, which is collinear. And then there's a spin reorientation, and it goes non-collinear. And it appears that both the Hall and the Nernst have this finite topological, so spin chirality, presumably spin chirality related effect that only is there in this lower temperature phase, but the amplitudes are different, and we started musing whether we can do better in the analysis, and we came up with an idea, but I'm not sure it's really really improving things. If you want, um, there, there, it's all in this, in this publication by Richard Schlitz. Okay, so, so this is the, the situation um, in ferromagnets. So again, uh, for the Hall effect, that, that's the phenomenological experimentalist perspective, but the theory friends always say, well, um, the cleaner description would be to say the hall, the transverse hall current here emerges because of this hall pseudo vector. I call it sigma, sometimes Libor and, and co call it H. Um, <laughs> it's just a name um, which contains these off diagonal conductivity tensor elements. And the key idea is for the hall effect is that this hall pseudo vector here is a pseudo vector, meaning it's dictates the symmetry for this effect. You get this odd time reversal. Um, if you invert magnetic fields, your, your electric field switches. This is all sort of enshrined in the pseudo vector properties. Um, and this entire approach eventually, the last decades, I guess, resulted in the notion in many people's minds, including mine, that um, to get a finite Hall effect or finite anomalous transverse transport, however you want to phrase that, you need something like a magnetic field. And that can be sort of the external magnetic field or these internal magnetic fields magnetizations that um, allow to generate the required symmetries for a finite Hall response. But this clearly is too simple. Um, 
because you can also look at antiferromagnets and see Hall effect, at least in some of them, and I'll try to, to put that on the plate now. So in, in the conventional line of thinking, this again is the situation I just tried to, to allude to. If you take a ferromagnet with finite magnetization, you can invert the magnetization, and that means that your Hall signal, your Hall current in, in this description will also invert. If you go to a conventional collinear antiferromagnet, two magnetic sublattices, again red and blue here, but in principle identical magnetic moments, um, you could say, uh, oh, this sublattice has positive Hall, this sublattice has negative Hall, so it sums up to zero. Um, and in, a theory, in an experimentalist's mind, that makes perfect sense. There is no magnetization, anomalous Hall effect in an antiferromagnet will not be there. Um, but this is uh, somewhat mind-bending already. If you, I, I like to draw, these, uh, to, to draw these cartoon pictures to get a, uh, an impression of what's going on. So if, if you start extending, um, you start wondering what, what happens if you now apply these symmetry operations. So you invert um, time, meaning you flip all the local moments, and then you could translate, um, and then you realize that you get exactly the same spin structure. And um, if you do that, in, uh, as I understand it, in a more uh, clean theoretical descriptions, if you have this TT symmetry, then it allows for antiferromagnetism, for this collinear antiferromagnetic order, but the TT symmetry, for instance, or PT symmetry, will kill um, the anomalous Hall or prohibit a finite anomalous Hall response. And this works for more complex spin structures like this one, um, where you see that there's sort of different, different uh, motifs repeating, which you can then connect with these symmetries um, to understand whether or not the particular antiferromagnetic or compensated magnetic sample would show Hall. Um, but about 10 years ago, it became clear also experimentally that this picture really is too simple. And it started off with these, what I now should call compensated non-collinear magnets, according to the Tomasz Jairo Libor <laughs> phenomenology. Um, so more complex uh, spin arrangements in which lead to a net zero moment. Uh, but obviously there is magnetic order in the samples. Um, and then you can even go collinear, uh, as became clear now very recently uh, in these ultramagnets. But I'll, I'll first look at these non-collinear things. And from my, that's my personal view again. I, I really understood the, the, or got the point when I saw this, this paper by Nakatsui et al. And they looked at this manganese 3 tin. I'm sorry, the laser pointer is dying. Um, so the manganese 3 tin has this, this very interesting uh, Kagome type planes where there is this complex triangular magnetic order. Um, if you do magnetometry, this is all data taken from their paper. Um, you see some small moments, probably stemming from counting. Um, but it is important to look at the scale. So this is milli Bohr magnetons per formula unit. Conventional ferromagnets have sort of one, two Bohr magnetons per atom or per formula unit. Uh, this is sort of a, a percent or, or less of this typical magnetization in a ferromagnet. So there's a tiny moment. But if you do Hall experiments, there is a pronounced anomalous Hall effect-like response um, and I'm, I'm trying to be cautious again, as, as Andy McKenzie mentioned. Um, I mean, here, obviously, this similar similarity or this one-to-one -one correlation between magnetization and Hall response becomes more and more questionable, right? <laughs> what is characteristic also is that this um, Hall response is strongly anisotropic, so it depends on which direction you apply field or you try to, to push the spins and which direction you measure the electric field and so forth. Um, so that really was a, was a game changer because maybe antiferromagnets were interesting for transport guys like me after all. Um, and then the Nakatsui group really, really pushed. Uh, they came up uh, quite soon with also Nernst effect. So this is the same material system, manganese 310. Um, and you see this now is Nernst. So this off-diagonal component of the Seebeck tensor versus field. And you see exactly the same, the same type of phenomenology. Okay. Um, and I don't know, am I, how am I doing in time? 
Okay. <laughs> then I'll. I'm I'll <laughs> so please, Andy. <laughs> no, then, <laughs> then I'll quickly, I'll quickly digress. We also we also played with these with these manganese three um, uh, related thin film samples, and one of um, the, the experiments we did goes back to an idea that I caught from um, Jean Philippe Anzermé and, and Gra Laurent Gravier from uh, Lausanne. They they used a focused laser beam impinging on a strip of metal to generate a thermal gradient into the sample. And for thin film people like me, this is a this is a very very interesting idea because usually in the thin film geometry, you can apply thermal gradients only in the plane because you can heat one or the other side. But with the laser, you can very elegantly heat the top and generate something that goes into um, the sample. And they just measured uh, the ensuing thermal power, thermal voltages. And if you do the experiment right, so if you orient an external magnetic field perpendicular to your laser-driven thermal gradient and your electrical detection um, direction, then you can again measure Nernst effect. Oh. I'm just curious, how do you calibrate the gradient of these cells? That's... Can make it homogeneous or not? Because, you know, the other day I saw you linear in gradient. Currents are easy to do linear because of the voltage yeah. that you measure yeah. in here. Is that you're making so, so that, that's an excellent point. That, that's the drawback of this approach. It's virtually impossible to really calibrate the thermal gradient. You can just try to guess. Uh, you can try to do cross calibration. What we, what we try to do is apply an in-plane thermal gradient, measure the Nernst, and then apply the laser-driven out-of-plane gradient and, and argue that this should be comparable. But you can't put little temperature sensors easily and measure the, the, the temperature differences into the sample because it's not, you, you, we don't but have anything into the depth, right? Do you check the linearity of the effect? Yes, the yes. The yeah. You can do that. You, it's you simply look at the linear. Yes, linear yes. Linear and, and then you have to be cautious. Um, this, this depiction is a bit uh, naive. Um, typically, we try to have the laser spot completely in the sample because otherwise you get sort of odd uh, metal absorbing laser and then maybe transparent substance not absorbing, you get in-plane thermal gradients as well. If you have a, a nice Gaussian profile, then these in-plane gradients average out usually because they are in all directions. But if you have edges or, or inhomogeneities, that can be tricky. So, so, so too, too small of a sample, that could be a problem. Yes, yes. But there is a huge advantage because you can raster scan this laser spot across the sample and generate local thermal gradients. And, and, and just go back and forth. And we, we used this approach for manganese three tin films that we again got from Claudia, as you might guess. Um, so this is a, a simple depiction of, of what we did. So again, a hall bar in, in manganese three tin. Um, and we raster scanned the laser in this little red area. Um, and if you look at the resulting signal, so that's the, the Nernst or transverse voltage that we pick up, um, you think, oh, that's super exciting. There's, there's different polarity, so we see the Nernst. The drawback is that if you start playing with magnetic field, this pattern doesn't care. So we can't do anything with magnetic field, so it could be the Nernst, it could be inhomogeneity, it could be anything. Um, and then Helena Reichlova uh, had this beautiful idea that maybe we were simply in, in a ferromagnetic language, not applying enough magnetic field to switch the nail order or whatever the, the, the higher uh, octopole moment or whatever is then the, the correct um, quantity that drives the Nernst effect. So she then heated the sample to close to the nail temperature, which is at around 420 Kelvin. So, so go to 400 Kelvin and apply the maximum field that we had in the setup, half a Tesla, and then go back and measure. And then you see all of a sudden that now you can change the contrast. Okay? And you can do that and play, uh, apply different magnetic fields, and then you can evaluate the average uh, response. So essentially, uh, evaluate the, the integral Nernst response, and then you get this nice hysteresis curve, as you might expect. Okay? And, the, the re and if you do that and go above the nail temperature, then there is no signal. And the really nice trick is that uh, eventually you even can use local laser heating to pole or um, orient the, this, this uh, nail order. 
Um, so so you, you, you start with, with um, imaging the sample at comparatively, comparatively low laser power and zero field. And then you apply a negative magnetic field, for instance, and the large laser power, and you just raster scan the laser in this little area. And then you image at zero field and low power again, and you see that this area that you raster scan has to um, You then apply positive half a Tesla and high power in this bluish region here, put you back. And you can do that and you know, start, start fooling around and, and Obviously, you can, you can thermally write something into that anti-ferromagnetic sample that then is robust against at least Tesla scale fields at room temperature. Okay, so finally, collinear ultramagnets. Um, what happens there? Uh, I couldn't resist and to flash this, this overview of a collinear uh, Magnetic order. I, I spoke about the ferromagnets, which have this um, finite uh, spin polarization in the band structure. Then the conventional antiferromagnets I alluded or briefly touched upon, they don't show interesting transverse transport for the reasons I discussed. But there is collinear systems with this rotational symmetry uh, that uh, are now called ultramagnets. And these material systems then have this finite spin polarization in the band structure, and they can show finite transverse transport responses. Um, and you already heard some uh, talks about the, one of the prototype ultramagnetic materials, ruthenium dioxide. Um, and if you missed them, tomorrow Helena will talk about this again. Uh, Yesterday, I fear there won't be any repetition, uh, Dominic <laughs> spoke about the manganese telluride where you see this uh, anomalous Hall response in, in thin films. And now I'll touch upon the manganese 5 silicon 3 um, as promised. Um, if you look at the spin structure, it's rather complex hexagonal system uh, and one interesting difference between this conventional uh, antiferromagnet, collinear antiferromagnet, and the ultramagnet or D-wave magnet is again this rotational symmetry that kicks in, and that makes these these uh, samples ultramagnetic. Um, there is quite some literature about bulk. Uh, this is essentially, I mean, 20, 30 years of research. Uh, particular by, by Zürgers et al., so the, uh, the Karlsruhe people and, then, and, and others. This is a, a schematic that I'll, is very useful to us because it shows, so, so that it's a lot of, that contains a lot of information, but you see here the resistivity, the longitudinal resistivity, they're measured as a function of temperature. And from the derivative of the resistivity, you see these two little blips, these little kinks, and these indicate two magnetic um, phase transition at what they call T and 2. There is the onset of magnetic order. So they call that the A antiferromagnetic 2 phase, AF2 phase. I now, in this modern language, should call it the collinear compensated magnetic phase, I guess. Um, and then below T and 1, so below about 60 Kelvin, you get this AF1 phase, which is non-collinear and compensated. Okay, so again, have a system which goes from collinear magnetic order, but now with a maybe more complex symmetry to something which is non-collinear. Um, and they, in particular, Zürgers et al. really did systematic transport characterization of these bulk and polycrystalline samples. And then um, you can try to analyze, so that's Hall data now. Uh, you, you, can, you can speculate whether there's some topological Hall effects kicking in in the low temperature, non-collinear phase, and <laughs> so forth. And they, they really did that in detail and then came up with this phase diagram. So above 100 Kelvin, these samples are paramagnetic, then they go into this collinear AF2 phase, and then below 60 Kelvin, there is this non-collinear phase emerging. Um, luckily enough, we get samples, thin film samples, grown in Marseille, the group of Lisa Miché. There's more information about the samples and the structural characterization here in the paper by Ismaila Kanta. Um, this is a TEM image of one of these samples, so they, it's grown 
The film is grown on silicon 111. Um, actually, the growth goes via a thin seed layer of manganese silicon. And then on top of that, um, you get this beautiful manganese 5 silicon 3, and you can determine the, the orientations. Um, and very important, you get this hexagonal symmetry uh, that is characteristic of the material. In the thin film form, the symmetry then is consistent with ultramagnetic uh, properties. And well, what, I, what is not maybe clear here, but the film thicknesses are in the order of 10 to 20 nanometers. The, the growth really is very delicate. And Lisa and, and uh, her team did a great job in finding the precise growth window way, where you can get these beautiful samples and not um, be too much affected by spurious phases, manganese silicon, manganese 3 silicon, and whatever, whatever not. Um, we tried to look at the uh, crystal structure of these samples. So this is a comparison of the bulk, uh, bulk uh, crystal parameters, so the in-plane and the out-of-plane, if you wish, in green or dark green, and then the film parameters in red as a function of temperature. So for the in-plane, um, in the bulk sample, you see that uh, above the magnetic order, there's sort of one um, uh, lattice parameter in plane, and then at the onset of magnetic order, there's a phase transition, um, and at the second uh, magnetic order temperature, another phase transition, so lowering of the symmetry also in the lattice, um, and the second phase transition you also see in the out of plane lattice constant. In the film, you have epitaxial uh, constraints, um, so the, the in plane lattice constants are different and do not change significantly as a function of temperature, but the out-of-plane lattice constant at this lower, the second phase transition, the lower temperature phase transition, has a little um, kink. I think the, so, so in the lattice, uh, in the plane, the lattice constant is larger, right? And, and out-of-plane, it's, it's smaller. Then you can try to do magnetometry on these samples. Um, this is really tedious. One of the, of the nice experiences as experimentalists dealing with antiferromagnetic or compensated systems, um, magnetometry is a nightmare uh, because you essentially see the substrate. And what, what we believe, what, we, what, what I show here is, is really only the substrate. So the, the response of the, of the film, oh, this is not the correct units, I'm sorry, this is not the, the final graph. Um, we really have so this is this is ampere per meter, not kilo ampere per meter. If you if you're doing magnetic magnetometry in SE units, in ferromagnets, this is uh, hundreds of kilo amps per meter. This is now ampere per meter, and if you zoom in around zero, this is milliampere per meter. So this is again um, maybe one milli mu bore per formula unit or so that we cannot exclude. This is the the sensitivity limit of the of the squid magnetometer, the best squid magnetometer that we have. So there is no moment in this. Then you pattern these into Halbach structures to measure transport. Um, so again, the black is the resistivity, and the blue here is this temperature derivative of the resistivity. And you can compare that to this diagram by Zerges et al. that I, I introduced, and uh, you see the same. So again, this, this lower blue curve here with these two kinks, we see the same two kinks in our samples. Interestingly, the, the ordering temperatures seem to have completely changed in the thin film, so the second transition temperature goes from 60 to 70 Kelvin, roughly, in the thin films. So 60 in the bulk, 70 in the film. And the onset of magnetic order goes, shoots up from 100 Kelvin to something like 250, okay? Well, and then you can, you can go and measure transverse transport. So this is now Hall effect versus field for different temperatures. At room temperature, there is only scatter. And then if you go below this 250K, uh, then you see clear anomalous Hall effect emerging. And every time I look at the data, I'm really uh, overwhelmed because this is a sample, again, which has no magnetic moment as far as we can tell. And if you only would show this, people would say, yeah, it's a ferromagnet, right? Anomalous Hall effect in the ferromagnet, what, what, what do you expect? Um, and you can go through this in, in some more detail. So I just took out the different temperatures to, to illustrate that. Um, yeah, it looks like a ferromagnet. Uh, I'm trying to indicate the temperature in, the, in this phase diagram resistivity curve. Yes? Is this raw data or is this uh, isopractic? No, this is, this is anti symmetrized. Um, I can, yes, I, I, can, I can show you the, the raw data and, uh, at the end if you want. 
Uh, I think I have a slide. And then if you, if you approach the, this second phase transition, you see these little, these little blips emerging, right? So if you're a topological transport guy, you say, oh, interesting. And then um, really at this phase transition, I mean, now you can't ignore it anymore and you can go back to my PowerPoint uh, analysis, right? Now it's very difficult to, to subtract, so I have a straight line. Additional humps, and you could call that topological. Um, if you go even lower 50K, I mean, completely obvious, right? There's, there's more structure. Uh, and then um, at 10K, well, uh, looks more like a normal magnet again. And then you can, you can try to compile all these data. So this is the amplitude of the anomalous hall, so the, the saturation, if you want. Um, and this is this topological uh, low field contribution. And, and pretty much like in the, in the um, ferromagnet, uh, the magnet's platinum tin I showed in the beginning, um, that you see this, this additional humps only emerging in this non-collinear phase. But that's a very, very touchy discussion. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, I won't try to claim that, that we see indeed the non-collinearity. Uh, it just might be coincidence that this disappears. Um, and then you can convert the, the anomalous hall uh, resistivity into conductivity, because our theory friends like the conductivity. And you can plot this conductivity into uh, what I call the Hall scaling plot. So this is again this paper by Onoda and co from 2008 where they compiled a whole zoo of different ferromagnetic materials. So conventional metals, gadolinium, iron, cobalt, magnetic semiconductors, gallimanganese, arsenide, and then different oxides and so forth. And the outcome is that there seems to be sort of a pretty universal scaling with different regimes that only depend on the exact magnitude of the longitudinal and the transverse conductivities. And now you can take the manganese 5 silicon 3 and put it in there. And again, though it has no moment, you could not distinguish or tell it apart from any of these conventional strong magnets. OK, so that pretty much is it. I'll, I'll share some, some more details in the, I don't know how much time I still have. OK, then perfect. Um, so one, one thing that really puzzled us for quite a while is that we, we did not get one sample from Lisa and, and team, but we got many. And um, some of them show this beautiful anomalous hall. So, so this now is raw data. Uh, and some of them show something which has some anomalous and some other. And some of them show something which is not at all what you'd expect for, for anomalous hall. Um, and we really scratched our heads for, for a while, but it turns out that you can clearly identify different properties. So the nice epitaxial samples show the clear anomalous hall response. And then as the more you get polycrystalline, the less this response stays. And we believe this is nicely consistent with this concept of altermagnetism, where this crystal symmetry and this um, rotation properties are crucial for the altermagnetic properties. And if you have a polycrystal, then obviously this average is out. OK, point one. Point two, that's very recent. Um, or we've been talking about it for a while, but I think it's a, um, only emerging now what, what is behind. Um, we, we use the so-called delta method to measure the transport. So we apply DC currents and measure DC voltage. And to be sensitive, we then invert the polarity of the current we apply every other uh, data point. OK, so we measure a positive current, take a voltage, we measure negative, positive, negative, and so forth. And then you can calculate the difference between these voltage. That's called the delta minus signal. And, and uh, that's what you'd expect. So this is the ohmic response, something that scales linearly with current, so the resistive response or the, the, the odd in current. Uh, and that's where you get this, this nice um, hole. Yes? For the same field, you, you do both. Uh, yes, we, we, yes, so we go to a field, and then we either, me either measure this sort of once, one, one positive, one negative, or if you want more statistics, you can measure sort of positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and so forth. Um, it turns out that the sensitivity is comparable to lock-in uh, experiments. Uh, you're a bit slower. But there is a, a, an incredible advantage, in my view, because it's completely clean in terms of sign. So we, if, you, if you hook up your wires correctly, you know exactly what the sign of the voltage is, whereas in lock-in experiments, there's always a phase. And, you know. 
So, so this is why we, we like this technique. Um, at, instead of looking at the difference, you can also look at the sum. We call that the delta plus. Um, people usually then associate that with thermal effects. It scales with your current squared, so joule heating type. Um, and if we do these experiments, we see spikes in this second harmonic or thermal uh, signal. And the spikes are exactly at the D magnetic, in the magnetic field range where the order seems to invert. So this seems to be just the magnetic resistance. I'm certain you are that you don't have an offset voltage. Um, I don't think it, it can be a magnetoresistance because it all also inverts polarity. So if it was a oh, conventional yeah. magnetoresistance, it should be sort of even in field, but this thing is odd in field, and we, we really were puzzled. We thought it could be a Nernst, maybe, um, because it's, so now this could be a thermal signal, but, but it, it's weird. And in the end, the explanation is quite simple. And this is an artifact I, I think it's most prominent in, in our, our type of experiments because we, we switch slowly the, the current polarity. You can actually understand that and trace it back to an exponential time dependence of the voltage. So in this experiment, we first saturated the sample at the high field and then ramped to negative. So we started here and then ramped to negative field like, like here and then stopped and just recorded the time evolution of the whole voltage. And you see that this is not instantaneously reaching a particular state, but the whole voltage decays over hours. Okay? And in our measurement technique with this comparatively slow, so order of seconds, I over-exaggerated here the, the time window, um, but if you take points seconds apart, you see this decay, um, and if you wait long enough, then obviously the, it becomes smaller, and we, we can trace all that, so we can measure several cycles, and and try to see um, that this decay. So, so the, the, the message I'm, I'm trying to convey here is that um, there is interesting slow dynamics associated with this transverse transport signals. Um, we can fit that with a double exponential. I don't know how meaningful that is, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's there. So it appears that only in this re-magnetization re or magnetic order reversal field ranges, we see this and uh, on, the, on the rest, um, the, the signal is in, instantaneous. Okay, so with that, I'm done. Uh, I'll just flash the summary or the, the outlook, and I'm looking forward to more questions, if you still have. Thanks.